The title of the message this morning is Why the Jews Killed Jesus. Why the Jews Killed Jesus. And the first question that I want to ask is, well, did they? <laughs> did the Jews, are the Jews responsible for the death of Christ? Now, according to uh, the Pew Research, you guys know Pew Research. They did a poll back in the early 2000s, which coincidentally enough was around the same time the movie The Passion of the Christ came out. You, I don't know if any of you have seen that, but you remember that came out in early 2000s. They did a research, um, did a poll in America, and they were wondering how many individuals in America believe that the Jews were the ones that killed Christ or killed Jesus. Interestingly enough, 26% of the people responded by saying, yes, the Jews were the ones responsible. The Jews did it. 60% said, no, the Jews did not kill Jesus Christ. Does anybody else find that interesting? I'm going to answer that. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, I'm going to answer it because I know probably what you're thinking. There's a couple of the main, couple of the main reasons why people say no. The Jews are not responsible for putting Jesus to death. Well, first, the Jews did not have the power and authority to do so. If you read in John 18:31, it says the Jews. Therefore, now this is when they brought Jesus to Pilate. And Pilate, he examines Christ, and, and, and he says, uh, you know, what, uh, you know what, is, what is your accusation against this man? And he says, I don't find anything wrong with him. And, he, and then Pilate tells them to, basically, you go and you condemn him, you put him to death. And I see how you guys are turning there. I wasn't planning on turning there, but we'll go there. John 18, 31. I got quite a few verses to cover. It says, Then Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. And so they said, Well, we can't put him to death. And so some people will say, Well, see, they didn't, it wasn't lawful for the Jews to kill him, so they weren't technically the ones that put Jesus to death. Now, it's also interesting to note that in Acts chapter 7, you guys know what Acts chapter 7 is about? I believe it's Acts chapter 7. Yep. Stephen. Stephen. Stephen was stoned, and I don't remember them taking Stephen to the Roman government in order for the Romans to kill him. They picked up stones, and they stoned him. So, well, which one is it? Are they allowed to stone and commit executive or capital punishment? Or not. Now there's other examples of that. The woman caught in adultery, they brought to Jesus, and they were going to see if it would stone her or not. And many examples, several examples throughout the Gospels where they picked up stones and they were going to stone Jesus, but they didn't. But then later on, for, and I believe it's because, you know, the scriptures had to be fulfilled in a certain way. Jesus had to die on a cross. And that's the second reason. They say, well, Jesus died on a cross. That was a Roman method of execution. And so it wasn't actually the Jews that put Jesus to death. Now, the third reason that people say, well, the Jews did not kill Jesus was because it was our sins that killed him on the cross, right? Isaiah chapter 53, we're familiar with that, that uh, the iniquity of, all, of, of us all was put upon Christ. That he died for your sins. You're the one responsible for killing the Son of God. Well, how many of those are true? All of them, right? <laughs> those are all true. But does that still mean the Jews were responsible? So were the Jews responsible, yes or no? Okay, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Were the Jews responsible? Now we're going to read in the writings of Paul, 1 Thessalonians 2.14. Paul is speaking to the church in Thessalonica, and he says in verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Okay, so he's speaking to the Thessalonian church, and he says, hey, you're partakers of the church, just like the, the believers in Judea. And the believers in Judea have suffered persecution from their own countrymen, just like you've suffered persecution from your own countrymen. But now look at verse 15. It says, speaking of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And so right there, Paul says that the Jews killed the Lord Jesus. I don't know how much plainer you can get than that. So they were responsible for killing Christ. Now turn to me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Now the reason why I, I, I think that most people, or the 20... I should say the 60-something percent that said, no, the Jews aren't responsible, is because it's not politically correct to do so. That would be considered anti-Semitism to say, well, the Jews, because throughout history and throughout the years, that has been the justification to persecute and oppress, you know, the Jewish people. And that's not right. That's not correct. That's... You know, even though they did do that. But look at uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 24 and 25. Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. It says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Verse 25 says, Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. So did they take responsibility? They said, His, his blood will be on us and our children. Now people have used that centuries later to say, Oh, well, they deserve to be persecuted or whatever because they're the ones who crucified Christ. Now, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. But they did say, His blood, we're responsible. The Jews took responsibility for His death. That's a fact. But are the Jewish people alive today still accountable for the death of Jesus? Some may say, yeah, I don't believe so. And the reason why is because that verse says, His blood be on us and our children. Right? And I believe that was fulfilled with the destruction of the nation, of the city of Jerusalem, and the temple in 70 AD. And so those individuals that... Uh, rejected Christ of the common people that still lived in Jerusalem at that 70 AD, that was the judgment of God for crucifying the Son of God. But we also know when Jesus was uh, being, uh, when he was in, in trial, he said, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory. And he said that to the leaders, the ones that were condemning him. And so we believe that uh, there will be a special resurrection. And those individuals that actually put him to death will be raised up in order to see Christ at his coming. In fact, it says that in Revelation. Let's turn there. So those who were directly responsible... will see Christ at His coming. This is Revelation 1, 7. It says, Behold, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see Him, and they also which pierced Him. 
they also which pierced him. I believe that's not only the Roman soldiers, but also those that were responsibility or directly responsible for putting him to death. And so I do believe that that verse was fulfilled, that his blood be on us and upon, his, upon our children that was fulfilled in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. But also, not all the Jews in Jerusalem at that time rejected Christ. There was many that believed in him. In fact, the whole Christian religion is based on Judaism. And the church got its start in from the Jewish religion. And those believers were Jewish. Until the Jewish nation rejected it and then it went to the Gentiles. So there was many of the priests. You think of uh, Nicodemus was one of them. Joseph. You think of prominent men like Joseph of Arimathea. So not all the Jews were in agreement. They were divided. Some believed, some did not. So who were the ones among the Jews that were the primary instigators in the death of Jesus? So who was primarily responsible? Notice Matthew 27, verse 19. Matthew 27, verse 19. Who was it that was responsible among the Jews for putting Christ to death? Matthew 27, verse 19, it says, When he was sat down on the judgment seat, his wife, this is speaking of Pilate, and Pilate's wife, sent unto him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priest, who was that? Yeah. The chief priest and elders persuaded the multitude. What did they do? They persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And so who was it that was the primary instigators in the destruction or the death of Jesus? It was the chief priests and the rulers, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were the ones that was, they were responsible Now, it's interesting, uh, the, all the hopes of Israel was for the coming Messiah. And when he came, they chose an imposter, Barabbas. Now, Barabbas, that's an interesting name. Does anybody know what Barabbas means? Son, Bar, means son, son of. Abbas, Abbas is father. So he's the son of the father. A counterfeit of the son of God. So instead of accepting the son of God, they accepted Barabbas, a counterfeit son of God, or son of the father. Something to think about. But not all the Jews were rejected him. Many of the chief priests, many of the... Many of the, the, the people accepted Christ, but it was, the, it was the leaders that were responsible and they were trying to persuade so that they could destroy Jesus. So really, why is it that they destroyed or they killed Christ? Now, there's many reasons. It's a multifaceted question and answer. But why did... They killed Jesus. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 63. But Jesus held his peace. This is during the trial. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God and tell that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Verse 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Verse 65, Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard 
his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, he's guilty of death. So why was he guilty of death? Because of blasphemy. Blasphemy. So the high priest said, I adjure thee, I appeal to the living God that you tell me. And so Christ had to answer his question. His question was, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And he says, you've said, that's right. You're correct, I am. And they said, this is blasphemy. Blasphemy. Was it blasphemy? No. Well, no, it wasn't blasphemy <laughs> because, because he was. Now turn to me to John chapter 10. That wasn't the only time. That was what they condemned him, or that's the reason why uh, they killed him was because of blasphemy. Or condemned him to death, I should say. John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus says, I and my Father are one. one. Verse 31, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So Jesus said, I and my Father one, and then they took up stones. They were going to stone him. Verse 32, Jesus answered, many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Verse 33, the Jews answered him, saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Right? So there's that word again. Blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. And Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. And so, there again... Blasphemy, because Jesus was claiming to be equal with the Father. He says, I and my Father are one. I'm the Son of God. And they wanted to stone him for blasphemy. But blasphemy was the, the justification that they used to stone, or, or putting him to death. They said, well, he's, he's committing blasphemy. That was the, the justification behind why the Jewish leaders wanted Christ dead. But is that the real reason? No. That was the excuse, right? <laughs> is it deeper than that? It's deeper. It's deeper. Matthew 27, turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Now why did they want to catch Jesus and be able to condemn him and put him to death? Was it simply because he said he was the Son of God? No. It's deeper than that. Matthew 27, verse 18 through 20. We'll start at verse 17. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas, or Jesus Christ? Jesus, which is called Christ. Verse 18. For he knew, that's Pilate, knew that for what? Envy. Envy. They had delivered him. Okay, so there's a little bit more going on. Even Pilate, I mean, you think about the, the heathen ruler, Pilate could even see the wicked. He knew the wicked hearts of these men. He knew that they were envious or jealous of Christ. Isn't that right? They were jealous. They were envious of Christ. And that's why they wanted him dead. But it doesn't stop there. Why were they envious or jealous of Christ? John chapter 12. Why were the Jews or the Jewish leaders during Christ's day jealous or envious of Christ? John chapter 12, verse 17 Here we read, it says, The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. And so Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and those that were there, they bear record of what Jesus did. 
Verse 18, for this cause, the people also met him for that they heard that he had done this miracle. So the miracle spread abroad. Verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Hmm. See, now we're getting a little bit closer to home. So the Jews killed Jesus. Well, was it all the Jews? No, it's primarily the instigators were the leaders. Well, why did they want? Well, they said it was because of blasphemy, but really they were jealous of Christ. Well, why were they jealous of Christ? Because other people followed Jesus. Are you following me? That's why they were envious of Christ. Because if they were following Jesus, then they were not following them. Because Jesus was not one of them. It's funny how, as history goes on, times may change, environments may change, technology changes, but human nature does not change. It's the same. They were worried that, well, maybe if they were alive today, they would be really concerned about how many followers they had on social media or how many views they would get. They, they, they wouldn't like it if somebody else got more views on their video than they did, to put it into modern context. They saw that Jesus took away their power, authority, and influence over the people, and that's why they hated him. That's why they were jealous. Because if they listened to Jesus, they weren't listening to them. And that took that authority and power away from themselves. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. We see this again. You see this time and time again all throughout the Gospels. But look at Matthew chapter 12. Now, Matthew chapter 12 is the chapter... Um, about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Um, also uh, about healing the man on the Sabbath day. But let's look at verse uh, 22. It says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a, a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were, what? Okay, now watch closely. All the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? What does that mean? Right, he's the Messiah. He's the Christ. How do you think the Pharisees and the leaders responded to that? Verse 24 says, but when the Pharisees heard it, heard what? When they heard that the people were amazed and claimed that Jesus was the son of David, when they heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub. What were they doing? <laughs> right, they were slandering him, right? I mean, they, right, they were actually committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Really, because the Spirit of God was working through Christ, performing these miracles, and the evidence was clear, even so that those that were uneducated and around said, wow, this is, this is amazing, this is the work of God. This is the Messiah, this is the Christ. And it was clearly evident, the work of the Spirit through Christ... And what did they do? They said no. They rejected. They hardened their hearts against the clear evidence. And not only that, they tried to turn the hearts of those that would believe. And how did they do that? They started slandering Christ. Oh, he's got a devil. He's casting them out by Beelzebub because they wanted to turn the hearts of the people away from Christ and to themselves. 
Well, that doesn't happen today, does it? <laughs> That's what happened this week. <laughs> Uh, on social media. <laughs> oh. But why did the Jews reject Jesus as the Messiah if they were looking and longing for the Messiah to come? Because that was the hope of all of the Jewish nation. They wanted the Messiah to come. Every mother in Israel wanted to give birth to the Messiah. They were all looking for it for thousands of years, and when he came, they rejected it. Why? Because of their misunderstanding of Scripture and tradition. Jesus did not fit the mold of what the Messiah was supposed to be and do. And so here the theologians that sat around and studied the Scripture every single day, all day long, and had no practical value to anybody in life, to sit around and study and then argue and debate. You know, they would have had a heyday on social media if it was available back then. We don't do that, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but they thought Jesus would be a mighty deliverer. Was he? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Jesus is a mighty deliverer from sin and from Satan, but not as a conqueror of the Romans. Right? Amen. Through their carnal understanding and reasoning, they misinterpreted the scriptures for the Messiah to be something that he was not. And so when he came, they didn't recognize him. They crucified him. Now, another reason the Jews hated and rejected Jesus was that his pure and holy life was a rebuke to their selfishness and hypocrisy. His life of service, his life of love and holiness and righteousness was a rebuke because it exposed the darkness and the condition of their own hearts. Isn't that right? And they didn't like that. Now, there's many factors, not just one. But one of the main reasons was they sought to maintain their authority and power over the people. They wanted power. They wanted, they liked that authority. They liked to be called rabbi. They liked to be called pastor. They liked the position. They liked people to look to them. For answers. But the basis, do you know what the basis for their power and their authority was? Do you know what it was? Why did they have a right to be in those positions? Why did they have a right to be in those positions of power and influence? Come on, Glenn, come on. <laughs> well, you know, I know you know the answer. Because of their... No? Because of their education. Their education qualified them to fill those positions. They deserved power because they were the ones who were educated. Because they knew the scriptures and they sat around. That was their job. They studied the scriptures, studied the law. They studied the scriptures day by day every single day, and so they knew. And their teachers were some of the most prominent rabbis and teachers in all of Israel. And so they went through the education system, and they were then qualified to be a leader in Israel because of their education. They deserved their power and authority over the people. Turn with me to John chapter 7. You probably didn't know that education is one of the main reasons why the Jews killed Jesus. But it is. John chapter 7 verse 31. 
Many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? Verse 32, The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. And so, word gets back, the people are saying, Well, this has to be the Christ. I mean, when Christ comes, is he going to do more miracles than what this man is doing? And they heard it, and they're like, we better get him now before his influence spreads even more. And so they sent officers. But the officers came back empty-handed. Look at verse 44. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Verse 45, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? And the officers answered, Never man spake like this man. <laughs> so they went to go arrest him and to take him, and then they started listening to him. And then they went back, and they said, no, We've never heard anybody speak like this. Well, why... Were they so amazed by his speech? Because the Bible says that he spoke as one with authority and not as the scribes. Because his authority was not, Christ's authority was not given based upon his position or his going through the system and getting a degree. He didn't, he didn't get a master's of divinity and then that's why he had authority God gave him power and authority by giving him the Holy Spirit. He had that power and authority direct from God. And so these men, they, heard, they listened to him and they came back and they're like, well, why didn't you? Well, never man spake like this man. Now look at verse 47. Look at verse 47. Then answered them the Pharisees. So the Pharisees answered and said, Are you also deceived? Verse 48. Now they're here, watch this one very closely. Look at verse 48. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Well, no, because they, if they believed on him and, and confessed it, then they would be kicked out of the synagogue. The Pharisees, the zealots, would make sure that they kicked them out. But, but notice that. I, I find that to be very fascinating, very interesting. It says, have any rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? So their justification, their reason, and their argument towards these officers was, you shouldn't believe on him because we haven't. Are you, are you catching that? Oh, yeah. We don't believe, therefore that should be reason and justification enough for you. Hmm. Well, why, like, how did they come, what, what brought them to the point where they thought that they were the only ones who could interpret the scriptures and, and the ones that said, you know, hey, if we believe it, then you should. You should follow what we say and believe. Tradition. It was a tradition. It was the system. It was, it was their education. You see, the normal person, the common person in those days, is a, it was an agrarian society. The people were working. They were busy. They worked hard. Just like many of you today, you, we work hard, right? We're busy, working with our hands, working our jobs. They didn't sit around and study and, and philosophize and debate and argue the scriptures all day, every day. Which we have people do today. Which are some of the most impractical, useless people. Some of that most... People that are educated today in today's society are some of the most impractical and useless individuals. That's a strong statement. I know. I'm aware of that. Not everybody. Look, there are some people that are very highly educated and are very useful. They put that 
education to use to help others. But many people go through high school and then college and they don't know how to change a flat tire or change their oil or they don't teach you in schools how to, how to balance a checkbook, how to manage money. They used to have domestic education, right? Or how to run a home, how to cook, how to clean. They don't teach any of those things in school nowadays. It is a crying shame, really. At YD camp, I taught mechanics. They're ages from basically 11 or 12 to 16, 17. Yeah. Not one of the boys had changed oil in a vehicle or a spark plug. Right. Right. Now notice verse 49. Verse 49. In John 7, 49, it says, Now listen, this is what they said. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? Verse 49. But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Very interesting. This people that knoweth not the law are cursed. The chief priests and Pharisees believed that the people were being deceived by Jesus because they did not know the law or the scriptures. But they did. They were the educated ones. They dedicated their whole lives to the study of scriptures, and the people were ignorant and more likely to be deceived. And so the people needed to listen to them because they knew better. They were educated. The proof or evidence that they gave as reason to reject Jesus was that they did not believe in him. The fact that we, as the leaders of the people, do not believe should be evidence enough because we are the educated ones. Now look at verse 14. John 7, verse 14. It says, Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Verse 15, And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Right? They were, they were dumbfounded, right? They didn't, they didn't understand. Like... How, how does he know these things? He, he's not educated. Was Christ educated? Amen. Yes or no? Yes. Well, the obvious answer is that he was. He was educated because he was taught of God. Jesus was educated. I'm not against education. A false education, right? A false education. And I don't think we truly understand the effects that education has on society. And that's why I bring this message because education or the system of education in the days of Christ is actually one of the reasons that led them to crucify the Son of God. And if you don't think the devil is not using education today, then you need to get your head out of the sand and open your eyes. Amen. Because you wonder why our world is headed in the direction it is? Well, there's a reason. There's a reason and there's an agenda behind it. But Jesus did not go through their system of education. He wasn't one of them. He didn't reverence and obey the rulers as the people did or follow their demands. He didn't recognize their authority. And through his influence, the people would also reject their authority. He was not one of their disciples. Thus, the system of, of education in Christ's day is directly connected to why they killed him. Why they killed him. Because they had set up a system of looking to men. Set up a system of looking to men. Looking to their rabbi, looking to the high priest, looking to the, instead of the word of God. And when they had a question, they would go to the, 
the rabbis. They would go to the leaders and ask them, and the leaders would explain, and they said, oh, okay, all right, I understand it now. But when Christ, when he was a child, he went into the synagogue and he asked questions that they couldn't answer. Turn to me to John 12. John 12, 42. John 12, 42 says, Nevertheless, among the chief, not all of the, like, the chief rulers and, and, and priests and, and, and rabbis, uh, the, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin rejected. But notice this. John 12, 42 says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. So there were some that believed on him. But watch this. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. And so they were convinced in their heart that this man is the Messiah, but because of their position, they did not confess him. Because of what it would cost. You see, they were caught up in the system because they went through the educational system and they got, they got a, their degree and they got a good career and, and their life is good and they're, they're following their career and... and, and Thankfully, their career is doing the Lord's work. But then something comes up. A truth comes. Christ himself comes. And they're convicted in their heart. And they, and they know it's true. They know that he's the Messiah. And they want and they believe. And they're convicted. But they don't want to get thrown out of church. They don't want to be disfellowshipped. They don't want to lose their position. They don't want to lose their power and authority. And so they did not openly confess Christ. Verse 43, it says, For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And that's really a result of the system of education. It leads individuals to look to men and to glorify men and the thoughts and the ideas of men instead of the word of God. Amen. That's right. As it was in Christ's day, so it is today. Can anyone deny that the system of education in our world is doing the exact same thing? It is doing the exact same thing. And just as the education in the church of Christ's day prepared or, or was grooming them to not be ready for the first coming of Christ and to reject Christ, so the education in today's society and in the churches is preparing people to not be ready for the second coming of Christ. In fact, it is training and grooming people to receive the mark of the beast. Amen. Amen, brother. Authority of man above God's word. Mm. Amen. Amen. And if you haven't seen it in the last couple years, we were told, <coughs> trust <coughs> the science. Trust the experts. And you know what? Many people blindly said, oh, I'll believe these government experts and these government science scientists because they know what's best for us. And they know what's best for me and my family. I mean, they wouldn't lie to me. <laughs> the government wouldn't do that, right? Trust the science. That's in the world, right? And there's many examples we could give of that. Trust the experts. Yeah, the experts are saying the climate. We have all of these experts that have these models that are telling us that the, the world is going to end in 10 years if we don't institute socialism, right? <laughs> 
Many put their hope and faith in men instead of the word of God. That is a result of the education system. Because you look to your teacher as the final authority. You look to your professor. You look to, to others instead of the word of God. And the churches that have adopted are doing the same. I've seen it over and over again. Over and over again. When a point of religious belief or doctrine or teaching is brought up to an individual, something that they, maybe they haven't heard before, it's brought to them... Many times, what an individual does is they will go where? Alan, recently you gave a testimony that when you studied about the, the seven-day Sabbath, and after you learned about it, what, you went to who? The adult man's class. You went to the adult... Yep, and then you said you went to, I believe it was your pastor. And you said, brother, whatever his name was, and you asked him about the seven-day Sabbath. And what did he say? He said they nailed that, those Ten Commandments on the cross. Right. He said they... <laughs> right, so he said the pastor said they nailed those Ten Commandments to the cross with Jesus. We don't have to keep those Ten Commandments anymore. And you said... <laughs> Ooh, thank you, brother, so much for relieving my, my conscience. Makes me feel a lot better. Makes me feel a lot better. He, he was getting his message that he wanted from that man. I don't know if that was necessarily the message that he wanted. I, I think Alan, I mean, I can see Alan is a truth seeker. He wants to know the truth. Right. But he thought it was the truth. Right, but I, what I'm saying is that he, he, he thought... We're so ingrained and groomed that when we have a conflict in our mind and we don't know, we go to men instead of God. Absolutely. And authority figure, and especially in the medical areas. Yes. Especially. especially in the medical field. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother ball game right there. That's a whole nother series <laughs> of sermons. But theologically, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. When we're approached with something, well, I don't know what that is. You know, let me read, you know, what does this mean in the scriptures? Well, let me go to somebody, right? Or this is, you know, somebody's saying this doctrine. Let me go to my favorite preacher or my favorite ministries. And we think that that is evidence because, you know, these ministries that, or, or this pastor or this evangelist is, you know, they seem to be righteous and, and they seem to be man of God. And so I can trust them. Smarter. Yeah, they're smarter than me. They've studied this out. And so I'm going to just trust what they say is true. That is dangerous, Amen. brothers and sisters. That is a deception and it is absolutely dangerous. It does not matter how many people believe in something. Amen. And it doesn't matter how few believe in it as well. It doesn't matter how many people keep the Sabbath. It if it was just here, it would still be the truth. And there's many other truths in the Bible. Doesn't matter how popular or unpopular it is. Our responsibility is, is this what the Word of God says? And if you don't know, and if you don't feel like you're smart enough, then praise the Lord, you're in the exact position that you can be in, that you need to be in to receive the truth. Amen. Because one of the problems in today's society and amongst theology and, and Christians and Christian denomination and churches and all of this is that we trust in ourselves and our own wisdoms too much. Amen. Because we approach the scriptures as if we already know what it says. And so we come to the scriptures to prove what we already believe instead of believing what the scriptures say. The system of education in Christ's day was the means that Satan used to ensure that they would reject Christ when he came. I believe 
that it's doing the same, Satan's using the same method so that we will be unprepared. We've been reading recently about Moses. We've been going through the book Patriarchs and Prophets, great book, really a blessing. And uh, we've been reading about the children of Israel and Moses. And I find it very interesting that how God worked in this man's life, that in the providence of God, the king went to slay all of the male children because a deliverer was going to be raised up. But that was the means of bringing Moses into the palace and getting to get educated in military and, and all of these things, in military training. And Moses, Moses believed that it was God's providence that he would learn all about the Egyptians and learn from the Egyptians, uh, the education of the Egyptians as concerning military strategy, and that God would use that to deliver the Israelite people. Yeah. And so Moses, he came out of you know, the, 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 the palace of the pharaohs, and then what did he do? He slew the Egyptian, and he thought that was going to cause a uprising, and he would lead them right on out of Egypt. And God said, uh-uh. In fact, you actually need to go to the U of M for 40 years. <laughs> U of M, University of Midian. It's not like the education of the Egyptians. In fact, Moses, I'm going to have you wander around in the desert following sheep and taking care of sheep to prepare you to lead my people out of Egypt. Now, does that make sense as far as education? Well, in God's eyes, it absolutely does. Because whereas before, with the education of the Egyptians, he was ready to take, you know, take things into his hands and to, to start a revolt... But after 40 years in the, in the University of Midian, <laughs> God came to him, right, in the, in the burning bush, and said, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And what did Moses say? Like, who am I? Who am I? See, Moses had to learn. Well, first of all, he had to go to the wilderness to unlearn many of the things that he had learned in the system of education, that he had before. So he had to unlearn some things and he had to learn some new things. I think that's what we need as a people. Amen. There's many things that we need to unlearn and there's some things that we still need to learn. And I think that's a great pattern of Moses that we need to separate from the world, move out to the wilderness or the country. Amen. He had great self-confidence. Exactly. Right. Because he trusted in the Lord to do what he knew he could not do in his own power and strength. It was impossible. And that's the lesson that we need to learn. Amen. That's the school that we need to go through. And of course, I've been thinking, you know, with DeMario and, and DeMario and starting this school right down by our house couple blocks away. Of course, it's been on my mind, and, and over the years I've thought about it, and it's been on my mind. But it's really something that we need to think about, and, and I believe it's something that we need to support. I know time is short. I know that. We don't know how much longer we have. But we need to make steps right now, and part of those steps is True education, because I still have children. Amen. I still have children. Amen. And while we're waiting for Christ to come, they need to be educated. And there's many families in our area that it's a burden. You know, there's many people around here in this area that share the same values and understanding of education. They realize it's not practical. They realize it's not uh, helping as many people, it's not practical. This is why I support DeMario and the starting of the school, and I think you should too. 
But why did the Jews kill Jesus? There's many answers to that, many reasons. But hopefully I brought about one that you have not made the connection before. And it was because Jesus was not brought up in their system of education. He was not one of them, and therefore they rejected him. So education plays a role Amen. in why the Jews killed Jesus. And I just want to end by reading a quote, because it applies to us today from the great controversy. It says, when Christ came to speak the words of life, the common people heard him gladly. And many, even of the priests and rulers, believed on him. But the chief of the priesthood and the leading men of the nation were determined to condemn and repudiate his teachings. Though they were baffled in all their efforts to find occasion against him, though they could not but feel the influence of divine power and wisdom attending his words, yet they encased themselves in prejudice. They rejected the clearest evidence of his messiahship, lest they should be forced to become his disciples. These opponents of Jesus were men whom the people had been taught from infancy to reverence, to whose authority they had been accustomed to implicitly to bow. How is it, they asked, that our rulers and learned scribes do not believe on Jesus? Would not these pious men receive him if he were the Christ? It was the influence of such teachers that led the Jewish nation to reject the Redeemer. And at the end, it's going to be the leaders and the educated individuals in the churches that are going to be the downfall of many. Amen. Continuing on. The spirit which actuated those priests and rulers is still manifested by many who make a high profession of piety. They refuse to examine the testimony of scriptures concerning the special truths for this time. They point to their own numbers, wealth, and popularity, and look with contempt upon the advocates of truth as few, poor, and unpopular, having a faith that separates them from the world." Christ foresaw that the undue assumptions of authority indulged by the scribes and Pharisees would not cease with the dispersion of the Jews. He had a prophetic view of the work of exalting human authority to rule the conscience, which has been so terrible a curse to the church in all ages. What was the curse? What has been a curse to the people of God throughout all ages? When men, human men, stand in positions of authority and believe that they can rule your conscience. That has been a curse to the church and to God's people. Amen. And his fearful denunciation of the scribes and Pharisees and his warnings to the people not to follow these blind leaders were placed on record as an admonition to future generations. That's us. Don't do it. Don't, do it. Don't believe me just because I stand up here and maybe you have respect or, uh, you know, whatever towards me. But don't believe me and take it, what I say, as... Right. I, I mean, I like to think that I'm preaching the truth and the gospel, you know. But I am a man. I'm human. I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. Don't look to me as your final authority. You look to the Word of God Amen. and ask God to show you the truth. Amen. And then we'll come together and we'll butt heads and we'll, sh you know, iron sharpens iron and we'll, we'll work it out. But... Love each other, love for one another, will prevail, yeah. will come into unity. Absolutely. The Romish church reserves, this is the last paragraph, the, the Romish church, the, the papacy, the Roman Catholic church, reserves to the clergy the right to interpret scripture mm -hmm. on the ground that ecclesiastics alone are competent to explain God's word. 
It is withheld from the common people. Though the Reformation gave the scriptures to all, yet the self-same principle which was maintained by Rome prevents multitudes in Protestant churches from searching the Bible for themselves. They are taught to accept its teachings as interpreted by the church, and there are thousands who dare receive nothing, however plainly revealed in scriptures, that is contrary to their creed or the established teachings of their church.